Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's good to be in front of you this October the 15th as we gather for morning devotions. It's always a blessing um, to be awake, to have another day, to do morning devotions, an opportunity to learn something new today. It's always good. So let's do our best to be a blessing and to share what we have with those who are in need. So let us move forward and start our meditation in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, with Stephen Charleston, a Native American elder, uh, author, retired Episcopal bishop of Alaska, and friend of mine from seminary, um, he invited me to a lot of interesting things. Uh, because of him, I got to go to um, uh, a Ojibwe reservation with a couple of other seminarians, and uh, we heard singing. They brought out the drum, sacred drum, and sang as it was becoming evening, and it was just magical to be in... And 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 I, I hesitate to name because I think it was the White Earth Reservation. I'm not a hundred percent sure, um, but it was beautiful. And uh, you know, in the piney woods, uh, out in the middle of what I thought was nowhere, because it was quite a distance away out into the country, and just to hear the the drums reverberating through the the nature, it was just awesome. And, uh, of course, without the campfire, it was extremely dark because we were out in the middle of the woods. So, uh, Stephen writes for us this morning uh, at uh, his website in Oklahoma. Every life is a work of art. Of many arts, in fact. Our lives are music, a symphony of love and loss. The haunting refrain of what might have been. We are paintings on the canvas of time. Bold strokes and bright colors, more mystery than meaning. Our lives are drama and comedy, a dance of chances, a novel filled with characters we have known and a few we have loved. The spirit is the artist. We are the creation. Amen. Same theme, we are creation. <laughs> as yesterday, just more colorful today. Good job, Steve. Good job. We now move to the Center for Action and Contemplation. The theme for this week is creator and creation. This morning is the first Bible. Father Richard uh, considers what we can learn from the first Bible of nature. The first act of divine, divine revelation is creation itself. The first Bible is the Bible of nature. It was written at least 13.8 billion years ago, at the moment that we call the Big Bang, long before the Bible of words. Ever since God created the world, God's everlasting power and divinity, however invisible, are there for the mind to see in the things that God has made. Romans 1.20 one really wonders how we miss that. Words gave us something to argue about, I guess, while nature can only be experienced and hopefully enjoyed and respected with admiration and awe. Don't, tear, don't dare put the second Bible in the hands of people who have, not lovingly, who have not sat lovingly at the feet of the first Bible. They will invariably manipulate, mangle, and murder the written text. The biblical account tells us God creates the world developmentally over six days, almost as if there was an ancient intuition of what we would eventually call evolution. Clearly, creation happened over time. The only strict theological assertion of Genesis story is that God started it all. The exact how, when, where is not the author's concern. The creation story, perhaps written 500 years before Jesus Christ, has no intention or ability to be a scientific account. 
It is a truly inspired account of the source, meaning, and original creation, goodness of creation. Thus, it is indeed true. Both Western rationalists and religious fundamentalists must stop confusing true with that which is literal, chronological, or visible to a narrow spectrum of human eye. Many assume the Bible is an exact snapshot, as if caught on camera, of God's involvement on earth. But if God indeed needed such literalism, God would have waited for the 19th century of the Common Era to start talking about talking and revealing through infallible technology. Science often affirms that we were for centuries a highly suspect intuitions of the mystics. We now take it for granted that everything in the universe is deeply connected and linked, even light itself, which is interesting in Interestingly, is the first act of creation, Genesis 1-3. Objects, even galaxies throughout the entire known universe, are in orbits and cycle around something else. There's no such thing as a whole universe as autonomy. It doesn't exist. That's the illusion of the modern individualistic West, which imagines the autonomous self to be the basic building block and the true seer. Yet all holy ones seem to say that the independent self sees everything incorrectly. Parts can only recognize parts, and so split things even further. The whole people see things. Whole people see things in their wholeness, thus create wholeness, holiness. Wherever they go and wherever they gaze, holy people will find God in nature and everywhere else, too. Handy people, excuse me, heady people will only find God in books and words. And finally, not even there. Amen. <coughs> we now go to Luther Seminary, the place that nurtured me and raised me up to be where I'm at right now. And this is God Pause, a daily devotion brought to you by the alumni of Luther Seminary. It's Tuesday. Uh, Psalm 91, verses 9 to 16. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near to your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Our devotion writer is Neil Snyder. And I look at this and, and uh, he got his MDiv in 1960. And then 24 years later, got his master's or MTH, which is a doctor of, of ministry. It's amazing. It's hard to do. But he is serving uh, or is at Mount Cross Lutheran Church, Tacoma, Washington. Um, he's been in ministry 32, over 30 years more than me. So that's almost 60 years. Anyway, <laughs> Neil writes, Sorry, uh, if you do the math, it's it's incredible. Uh, how do these soaring words of promise align with yesterday's reading from Isaiah about the suffering servant of God? Martin Luther insisted that the Bible readers must note to whom the words are addressed, whom the psalmist in verse 1 addresses, as those who have made the Most High your dwelling place. How can we claim to share the psalmist promised alongside millions of who have suffered even much more than the psalmist would seem to allow. 
The answer lies in hearing God's promise from the perspective of the whole counsel of God, as contained in the Scripture. We let Scripture interpret Scripture. In this way, I can understand these words of the psalm to be congruous with a life of suffering only in relation to every believer's ultimate goal to live by the promises of God. The Apostle Paul's words are helpful for, to me. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us, Romans 8.18. 8, Unbelievers scoff, believers rejoice. Heavenly Father, in pain and suffering, loss and death, your shelter hovers over us and surrounds us, and we are safe. Thank you from today to eternity. Amen. I hope that you found these words uh, inspirational. I hope they guide you, and I hope they uh, care for you this week as you travel. Always be ready to be a neighbor. There's always an opportunity for you to be a blessing. Amen.